Thank you, Renee. It is always good to gather around God's word together. And this morning, we are going to spend some time looking at 2 Corinthians 4, 1 to 6. I want to remind you that you should have your Bible and a piece of paper and a writing utensil. And that'll come in handy this morning as we look at the word of God. In October 1941, Winston Churchill, Prime Minister of England, went back to the school that he once went to, and he was delivering an address to the students there at that school. And he spoke some famous words, and today you can buy a coffee mug and you can find these famous words on there. And there are debates as to what these famous words actually were, but according to Churchill's manuscript, At one point in his address, he turned to the students and he said this, never give in, never give in, never, 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 in nothing, great or small, large or petty, never give in, except to convictions of honor and good sense, never yield to force, never yield to the apparently overwhelming might of the enemy. It was incredible because that speech went miles in giving the people of Great Britain courage in the time of a really bad disaster, World War II, in their nation. From that day, almost 70 years ago, to our day, I think that I could say that as a people, we are not Churchill kind of people. We give in quite a bit. We don't persevere. We don't endure. We don't have great attention spans. There isn't much perseverance in our lives, in our culture, in our society. Neil Postman warned us a couple decades ago that we were in danger of amusing ourselves to death. And that certainly is something that most of us can relate to. Michael Jordan may be the world's best basketball player, but in 1984, when he began to play for the Chicago Bulls, he came in and he noticed that in the fourth quarter, when a basketball team fell behind by 10 points, they would lose heart and they would believe that the game was over. And Michael Jordan said, no, it's not. And by the time he retired, he'd won six championships. The value of perseverance in life cannot be overestimated. As you have that piece of paper with you, I would like you to take that piece of paper and on the top of it, I'd like you to write a word. Failure. Failure. And I want you to think of a time in your life that you did not persevere, that you did not keep going, that you did not keep on keeping on. And I want you to think of that in terms of a one-word answer. What is your biggest failure in perseverance? In my life, the one word that I would put after failure to persevere would be piano. Many times when I hear Sue playing this piano, I'm reminded of the fact that I did not persevere in piano lessons. My parents told me that I would someday ask them why they didn't force me, and it didn't even take eight years for me to come back and say, why didn't you force me to persevere in playing the piano? Well, as we follow Jesus, giving up or giving in is our greatest enemy. And over the next few weeks, we're going to look at several passages of Scripture that remind us of the importance of persistent stick to in the way that we follow Jesus Christ. The Bible speaks about perseverance and endurance often. And there's a phrase in the New Testament, and the phrase is, lose heart. And there are half a dozen passages that talk about losing heart. And as you think about times in your life that you have lost heart, When you lose heart, you're about an eighth of an inch from giving up. And isn't that really where perseverance 
comes down to a rubber meets the road experience in our lives. When we lose heart, we are in danger of giving up. Well, back to 2 Corinthians 4, 1 to 6. Just a little bit of background. The book of 2 Corinthians is written by the Apostle Paul. He wrote the Corinthians two letters. The church in Corinth was quite a mess. Uh, there were factions, there were sexual sins, and when they celebrated the Lord's Supper, they had a big feast and people got drunk. So there were some problems in Corinth. Uh, the reason Paul wrote this second letter, however, was to teach the Corinthians that the suffering in his life did not cancel out his authority as an apostle or the message of the gospel that he was bringing. Well, back to the piece of paper. You've already included a, a failure in your life to persevere. I want you to write another word down on this piece of paper. And the word that I want you to write down is ministry with a question mark. Ministry. And the question that I have for you and the question that I want us to look at really quickly is this question. What is ministry? Now, the word that the New Testament uses for ministry is really simple to translate. Ministry is equal to service. And the word deacon that we find somewhere in the New Testament that talks about servants in the church, uh, that's a real similar word to this word for ministry. And the word ministry is important as we look at 2 Corinthians 4 because verse 1 sort of has ministry as the centerpiece of the verse. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. Notice throughout this passage that Paul uses the word we, 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 and the word our, our, our a lot. He doesn't speak in the third person. He doesn't speak in the second person. He speaks in the first person plural. We. As we look at this passage, what is ministry? Uh, the clues to ministry come in verses two, three, two and three. We have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Remember, Paul's writing to a church and ministry, this service, is in the context of a body of believers. Ministry is about God's word. Ministry is about an open statement of the truth, not cunning, not deceit, but an open statement of the truth. And we also find the word gospel in these verses. I would define ministry this way. Christ-focused ministry is service that supports the communication of God's good news found in the Bible. Christ-focused ministry is service that supports the communication of God's good news found in the Bible. We have some good news to share. There's this incredible message that's been entrusted to us. Although we are separated from God by our sin, we have a way to God. The way is Jesus Christ, and all we have to do is believe. God did not have to do this, but he acted in grace toward us. Believing in Jesus really means Believing, trusting, and following. And the Bible calls that faith. And we have this good news, this message to share. Uh, verse five says, what we proclaim is not ourselves, but 
Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. Now, I would imagine that most of you who are hearing my voice right now have at some point in your life made a decision to trust Jesus, to follow him, to place your faith in him. But if you haven't, I hope you'll do it right now. I hope you'll put your faith and your trust in Jesus. For me to even give you this gospel right now, this good news, it's interesting, but I can't do this ministry without someone running a camera. I can't do this ministry without someone hooking up electricity. I can't do this ministry without lights. I can't do this ministry without a building and with someone paying for that building. And as you think about ministry, I I was thinking about children's ministry this week. We here at Calvary when we gather physically have children's ministry. We have classes for kids. We try to help them become devoted, joyful disciples of Jesus Christ. And as we do that, we have people who teach them. But these teachers need something to teach. And so we have a curriculum that someone purchases And we need a place for them to meet and so we have this building and people pay for this building so that we can be here. And oh, by the way, for teachers to teach students, we need the students to get here and six and seven-year-olds don't have a driver's license and so their parents need to bring them. And so ministry and supporting gospel ministry is, is a huge, huge process. Well, once you've made the decision to follow Jesus, what's next? You follow him, you obey him, you act in the ways that he calls you to act, and and you serve him. And you serve him in this area that we call ministry. And you support the communication and the proclamation of the gospel in, in, in any way you can. Now this sounds great, What could possibly go wrong? (laughs) I mean, God has given us ministry and we have this great message and we support it and we proclaim it. What could possibly go wrong? I want you to go back to your piece of paper and I want you to put another word down on that piece of paper. And the word I want you to put down is problem with a question mark. What problem could possibly come up in ministry as followers of Jesus? What could possibly go wrong? Well, here's something that could go wrong. We could lose heart. We could give up ministry because so many people don't believe. It's tragic. It's tragic to think about all of the people who don't believe. It's tragic to think of people that we love and that we want to follow Jesus who do not believe. Uh, verses, verse three says, and even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. We see that to many, the gospel, the message that we have is veiled. They can't see it. If you've tuned in to this before, this whole experience at Calvary Church online, you notice that we have a wall behind us. And you might see these sparkling little things on the wall. Those are names. Those are names of people that we have placed on that wall with a hot glue gun. They're people that we are praying for that we desire to see to come to know Jesus Christ. I've got to tell you that more of those names have fallen off than have been taken off because they've come to know Christ. 
Worldwide, it is claimed by some optimistic pollsters that one out of every seven people somehow claims the name of Christ. Think about that. From Acts chapter 2, 120 people praying in a room to the present day, one in seven people on planet Earth is a follower of Christ. You flip that around, however, that means that about 86% of our world has nothing to do with Christ. How many people do you know who don't know anything about Jesus? Uh, the, the names of people that I put on this wall all knew something about Jesus but had rejected it. They didn't believe. Well, I'm hoping right now that you don't turn off your computer <laughs> because right now you might be depressed. So far, this message may have moved you more toward giving up than not giving up. The question comes to all of us. How do I not lose heart? And that's the last thing I'd like you to write on this page. How do I not lose heart? How do I not give up? How do I keep on persevering instead of giving in? How do I keep from losing heart? Well, this passage, this passage has become so dear to me. About 12 years ago, I was asked to review a book with another group of about 100 pastors. And we examined this passage in depth and it's become so dear to me. And there are at least two huge encouragements to help you persevere in these verses. How do you keep from losing heart? Number one, see the light and keep on seeing the light. Look at verse six of 2 Corinthians four. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You know, followers of Jesus come in all shapes and sizes and colors and ages and personalities. But there is something that is common in every single follower of Jesus Christ. Followers of Jesus see the glory of God in Jesus. When a follower of Jesus thinks of the cross or perhaps sees a picture of the cross, and sees what happened on the cross that the Son of God, God himself, Jesus Christ, died in their place. The follower of Jesus says, oh my, oh my. That's the glory of God. When a believer in Jesus Christ says, oh my, that believer sees the glory of God. Many of us love to read the book of Genesis and read about the power of God. Time and time again, God spoke things into existence. He spoke and it just existed. And you remember in Genesis, God at one point said, let there be light, light, boom. There's light. This passage has that in mind. You were once walking around in darkness, blind, and you might not have even known it. And God said, light. And you saw the glory of God in Jesus Christ. That's the ultimate glory of God. 
And if you don't want to lose heart, if you want to persevere, if you want to endure, if you want to keep on keeping on, see the light and keep on seeing the light. Don't give up looking at the light ever. God said, let there be light. Let Steve Kolb see, and I saw. And if you don't want to give up, keep on seeing the light. There's a second way in which we can avoid giving in. Verse one, Paul says, therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. Why didn't Paul say grace instead of mercy? Throughout the New Testament, you sometimes see grace and mercy together. I kind of like grace more than mercy. Grace is like a gift, unmerited favor that God gives us. Mercy, according to the dictionary, is compassionate or kindly forbearance shown to an offender, an enemy, or other person in one's power. I prefer grace over mercy because mercy reminds me that at one time in my life, I was God's enemy. When I was a kid in elementary school, there was a group of us that used to wrestle. And the king of wrestling would get you down and would have his knees on your shoulders and would tell you to beg for mercy. And if you did not say mercy, there was a glob of spit hanging from his mouth that was waiting to fall onto you. And when I think of mercy, that was my first lesson in mercy. And I usually screamed for mercy because I didn't want that glob of spit. Now, he was the victor. He was in charge of me because he had won this wrestling match. I needed mercy. We have been shown mercy. We were God's enemies, and now we're his friends. There's nothing else like this in the whole world. There is nothing like God's mercy. There was a time that as a follower of Jesus, you were his enemy. And God said, let there be light. And you saw the glory of God in Jesus. And God said, okay, join me. And not just join me, come into my inner circle. Come into my special group and join me in what I'm doing. The stuff that I'm doing on earth, the way that I am serving humanity, I want you to join me in that. There is nothing like this anywhere. See the light and keep on seeing the light. Keep on seeing the glory of God and Jesus and keep on seeing the mercy that he has given to us, to you. Well, what is ministry? Ministry is service that supports the communication of God's good news found in the Bible. Uh, What could possibly go wrong in ministry? What's the problem? Well, the problem is we can easily lose heart because people don't believe. And how do we keep from losing heart? We see the light and we keep on seeing it. We feel the mercy, and we keep on feeling it. These are interesting days, challenging days. Most of us have not gone through something like this experience before in our nation, in our world. I go back to Winston Churchill's speech in 1941. After telling these students 
to never, 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 never give in. Churchill closed his speech by saying this. Do not let us speak of darker days. Let us speak rather of sterner days. These are not dark days. These are great days. The greatest days our country has ever lived. And we must all thank God that we have been allowed, each of us according to our stations, to play a part in making these days memorable in the history of our race. Brothers and sisters, these are not dark days. These are great days. Don't say that these days are dark. They're stern days. May we each one play our part in making these days memorable in the history of the kingdom of God here on earth, here at Calvary Church. Gracious God, we thank you for the gift of perseverance, the gift of endurance, persistent stick to We pray that you would give it to us in abundance. And may we never, 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 never give in. We have an enemy. The enemy is real. But we serve the God who said, let there be light and spoke light into existence. We serve a God who took enemies and made them friends and brought them into his inner circle and is sharing what he is doing in the world with them. So maybe we be a part of your ministry here on earth, God, the ministry of testifying to the gospel of your grace. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.